Well, welcome. This is John Sarver with the uh, Great Lakes Renewable Energy Association. Uh, please mute yourself until after the presentation. Yeah, uh, first thing yes. I need to do is to uh, thank our sponsors, which include the State Department, Eagle, uh, Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, Homeland Solar, not in McKay, Iron Ridge Racking, Harvest Solar in Shri, Shri Energy. Thank you for your sponsorship. I, I have seen a lot of you before, and so I know a lot of you are GLREA members. If you're not, I'd like to encourage you to join. You can do it at our website, uh, the three W's, glrea.org. Uh, we are a small nonprofit. Uh, our membership is real important to us, and it helps support our educational and advocacy efforts. And one of our important advocacy efforts we're going to find out about tonight. I think many of you know that uh, John Richter is a, a senior policy analyst with Great Lakes Renewable Energy Association. And what that means is when we intervene in uh, cases before the Michigan Public Service Commission, we have to have witnesses that kind of tell our story and make our recommendations. And John is our one of your senior policy analysts who does that. Uh, so he gets to read lots of pages of the application, uh, other witnesses, uh, helps to write test uh, briefs and counter briefs and whatever. Uh, so, uh, uh, and John and I have known each other for a long time. He's been involved. We were just trying to figure out how long. Uh, he's been involved with energy basically forever. Uh, and so with that, let me uh, turn it over to you, John. And again, please mute yourself. Thank you, John. And thank you all for coming tonight. I will share my screen here. Can you all see that now? Yes. Very good. All right, so a uh, recent case with the Public Service Commission that has been settled uh, went to settlement, uh, which is one of the ways a case can end, uh, was with the DTE Integrated Resource Plan. So I will discuss uh, what that is and uh, why it matters. So the Michigan Public Service Commission is charged with regulating Michigan's state chartered monopoly utilities, including the electric utilities. Now, historically, the focus uh, was on rate making, right? What are the rates that we have to pay for our electricity? Uh, those have to be approved by the Public Service Commission. There's an uh, enormous process around that in which uh, costs are, are carried through and allocated to different groups of customers and, and rates are created. But over time, uh, the Public Service Commission has uh, gained additional regulatory responsibilities. In 2016, the legislature uh, required the electric utilities to file an integrated resource plan at least every five years. Um, so far, they've actually been doing it a little more often than that. And in that integrated resource plan, the, the utility has to show how they're going to meet projected customer demand for energy over the next five, 10, and 15 years. Mm -hmm. Um, these are contested cases. Uh, affected parties can intervene in them. Uh, it does require a lawyer, so it's uh, not a low-cost venture. Uh, but we've been a regular intervener in these cases for the, well, at least the five years I've been doing it. Now, in our uh, IRP, the, the core of it is the resource plan, right? What uh, amount of electrical demand is the electric utility projecting, right? Because they have to project way out into the future. Uh, what power plants are they going to retire and what new power plants might they acquire? Uh, they might buy one that exists or they might build a new one. But there's some other features uh, in the resource plan as well. As well. Uh, they're required to include energy waste reduction plans. So how does the utility encourage customers to engage in energy efficiency? And that might be things like rebates for energy efficient light bulbs or... Um, uh, smart thermostats or, or things like that. They also have demand response programs. Uh, these are programs where the utility gets customers to reduce their use during periods of peak demand. And that can reduce the amount of generating capacity that they have to have uh, online because they can, right when they need it, reduce demand. 
Now in this integrated resource plan case, DTE and 18 different intervening parties uh, reached a settlement agreement and the MPSC has approved that settlement. So this is all finalized. Now the settlement is, you know, it got a lot of stuff in it. It has 30 different terms in the settlement. So this is a summary. I, I can't tell you everything in this amount of time. Uh, the whole thing is 44 pages, which is not, which is very short from a regulatory perspective. Um, and uh, there's the, the link there, or, um, you know, you can ask me for it and I'll, I'll send it to you uh, if you want to read the actual settlement agreement. Integrated resource plans are really important because they affect things for the long term. Uh, utilities typically have a rate case every year. Uh, they have a voluntary green pr uh, pricing program case every every year or two. Uh, but the, the IRPs are these long-term decisions. What power plants are we going to be paying for over the coming decades? Uh, if you look at power plants that Michigan utilities are retiring, they're all about my age. They're all 60-some years, right? So when you, you build a power plant, it's a long-term commitment. Uh, and then the kind of power plant determines what kind of fuel we're going to have to be buying over the coming decades, how much CO2 the power plants are going to be spewing, how much health harming pollutants, uh, mercury and particulates and ozone and all kinds of nasty things the power plants will be spewing, how customers will be incented to reduce their electricity use. That's that energy waste reduction programs and how customers will be empowered to supply their own energy or perhaps discouraged, uh, depending on if the utilities have their way or not. All right, this is a kind of busy chart and I'm gonna walk through it slowly, but this is the core of the integrated resource plan. Um, I've got four columns here. The first column talks about time periods, right? The first row is the first five years of the integrated resource plan, then the second five years, and then the second 10 years, right? So it goes out 20 years into the future. The first column was the DTE 2019 plan. So they filed an integrated resource plan in 2019 and the commission rejected it uh, as unsatisfactory. So here we are in 2023, they've proposed a new plan that's quite different. And then the, the row all the way to the right is the settlement agreement, which is fairly close to the, uh, the proposal, but it has some very significant differences. So back in 2019, they were saying in, in uh, you know, in the next 10 years, they were going to install 417 megawatts of renewable energy. This time they proposed 800 megawatts of renewable energy in the first five years. Obviously, a huge increase in how much solar and wind uh, DTE is planning to install. In the settlement agreement, we got them to agree to 1,200 megawatts of renewable energy in the first five years. They're also, for the first time, proposing a substantial uh, amount of battery capacity, uh, 240 megawatts of batteries. This will be lithium-ion batteries. Uh, the settlement, uh, we got that up to 350 megawatts of batteries. And they proposed and will continue to uh, convert the Bell River uh, plant to gas. Right now, the Bell River plant is burning coal, and they're going to convert that to a gas plant. And I'll, I'll talk about that in some more detail on a later slide. Uh, originally, they were going to retire Bell River, but then not until 2030, and then they weren't going to retire Monroe until 2040. Because they converted Bell River to gas, they still have that capacity there, and they are able to retire half of Monroe in 2028. Um, during the second five years, they're going to install 4,000 megawatts of renewable energy. Well, okay, that actually got reduced to 3,600 because basically we, were, we moved 400 megawatts from the second five years into the first five years, right? That's how we got from 800 to 1,200. Okay, this dropped from 4,000 to 3,600. Uh, likewise, the batteries, that was a move in the settlement agreement from the first, from the second five years into the first five years. Um, but the first five years are what's really important in the plan because they're going to file a new plan before they get to the second five years and, and it'll you know be all different anyway. Uh, so what the plan says for the next five years is what's really important. And that's where we uh, won some victories. Sorry about that. 
um, in the second 10 years. Uh, so the settlement agreement didn't change that much. They're going to install 2,100 megawatts of solar, 7,900 megawatts of wind. That's a lot of wind turbines. A uh, thousand megawatts of batteries. There, um, that's a leftover. That shouldn't be there. Retire the second half of Monroe in 2035. They had proposed in the settlement agreement. We got that reduced to 2032. And I'll talk about why that's important. Also in the plan in the second 10 years, they have a 946 megawatt shortage of generating capacity, which they plan to fill with some kind of unspecified new plant. Um, DTE is very clear that they're leaning towards a new uh, combined cycle gas plant um, with uh, carbon capture and sequestration find that a little bit questionable. There are no such plants operating in the world yet. So uh, that's a bit of a aspirational goal. Now, one of the most important things that we got in the settlement agreement is an increase in the cap on distributed generation. So the distributed generation program is what replaced net metering. That's uh, what all the solar customers are on. But there was a cap in the law on that that said that the utility doesn't have to connect under the DG program more than 1% of their total peak summer capacity. Now, in fact, that 1% was broken into three subgroups, so it's really less than that. But the point is, we got that increased. The commission can't order that, but we got the utility to agree to increase that cap to 6% of their load. So from 1% to 6% is an enormous jump. And that's going to buy us a lot of years in which we can have more customers uh, hook up to solar. Now, because there's so much on this chart, I'm going to pause here and ask people if they have questions. John, can I make a comment? Sure. Just to put in perspective how big a jump 1% to 6% is from from the initiation of Public Act 295, which was in 2008, until 2023, we have barely hit the 1% this month. No, we haven't really hit it officially yet. So going from 1% to 6%, as John said, is really going to buy us a fair amount of time. Now, the there is a increased acceleration of installing solar systems but this is a significant win, and all of our business members um, can can therefore plan to market solar, knowing that they're going to have the capacity to connect people, and they'll be able to get compensated at the distributive generation rate um, for for a number of years. So I'll stop there. Thanks, John. Yeah, go ahead, Dennis. Thank you. Um, I've. I'm relatively new at all this, and uh, this is the first time I've heard about utilities having batteries uh, that they're using for the systems. Uh, could you explain just a little bit? I don't need a lot, but anyway. Sure, sure. No, and it is a new thing, right? So you're, you're not behind the times. Um, DT's uh, started, but not yet completed, I don't think, a very small battery pilot. And then, you know, they're proposing the next five years to build something really substantial. And the purpose of that is to shift um, the renewable generation from when it's generated to the times it's most used, particularly solar. So your peak solar production is around noon, right? 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. or maybe 3 p.m. based on uh, daylight savings time. But the utilities peak demand is around 5 p.m. And so um, with a lot of solar installed, the utility may have excess generation during the peak solar hours. They can store that energy in the batteries, charge them up, and then discharge those batteries uh, during their peak demand periods in order to uh, meet that peak demand. So that's why you're seeing uh, really around the country, utilities that have installed large amounts of renewables also installing batteries, particularly it's good for time shifting solar. Uh, John, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, my question is about batteries, too. Uh, uh, I, I always think of batteries as storing energy, so that would be megawatt hours. Is that what yes. you mean when you say megawatts? 
No. Um, so I agree with you. I think the more important metric of batteries is the energy storage capacity, not the uh, power output capacity, which is really not the batteries. It's the inverter that's paired with them, right? Uh, the utilities are used to thinking of generating plants and what their capacity is, so they keep doing this. Uh, but in this case, all these batteries are designed to be four-hour batteries, meaning that their uh, capacity is you know, four times this in megawatt hours. So the 1,200 megawatts of uh, batteries would have 4,800 megawatt hours of energy capacity. That's a great question, John. Thank you. Hey, John, uh, is one way to think of the batteries is that it's an uh, alternative to use in, uh, you know, gas peakers? Because uh, uh, well, that, That's exactly the competition for them. Yes, yes. Um, typically now utilities, when they have, you know, their, their highest periods of use, they fire up these uh, peaker plants, which may be gas. DT has some oil fired ones still, much to my surprise. Um, and uh, they're very expensive to operate. And so the batteries can dramatically reduce the uh, operation of the peaker plants. And we're even seeing in other jurisdictions, not here in Michigan, but utilities replacing peaker plants outright with uh, battery storage systems. And just to clarify, too, you know, when you have an integrated resource plan, one of the issues obviously is cost, right? And so the, the basically, there's a justification that the uh, the batteries is the least cost option to kind of fulfill that need, right? It's actually cheaper than those gas peakers, it sounds like. Yes, they use some very complicated simulation software to take different combinations of resources and they estimate their costs, their lifetime costs, including fuel and things, and uh, how it meets the demand for electricity in every hour of the coming 20 years based on their projections. So it's really a very complex and detailed analysis that they do. And the ultimate metric is, you know, it has to meet demand during all the hours and What's the lowest cost way of doing that, right? That th Those are the, the things they look at. Leandre just made a comment that we should mention that Lunnington, you know, pump storage is is like a big battery. And so that's a real a real advantage for our, our grid system to have uh, the Lunnington pump storage that can kind of store the energy uh, at night in the sense of water and then, you know, let it run downhill and produce power during the day. Uh, Clifton, go ahead with your question. Yeah, back on batteries, this may be a little too detailed, but the four hour, is that 100% down to zero or 80 to 20, or are they, are they thinking that far ahead? That's a great question. I, mm, I'm i not certain of the answer. I don't think it's down to zero, but I think it's like 100 to 20 or something like that. It's the design criteria for the operation of the, the battery, whatever that is. Even, even if they go with lithium iron phosphate. They can't do 100 to zero without ruining right. the battery. Yeah, yeah, you can once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, thanks. Uh, Dale. Yeah, thank you. Uh, two questions. Does this include nuclear at all? And then the other question is, does that require DT to do anything about disposal of the battery when they're at end of life? Two good questions. So uh, on the nuclear question, uh, presumed in all this, and you don't see it in the chart, is they continue operating the Fermi 2 nuclear power plant out through its you know, license extensions. Um, but in terms of a new plant, uh, they did in that 10-year plan where uh, they said, you know, they got to add 946 megawatts of something. They said that could either be uh, a gas plant with uh, carbon sequestration, or it could be a small modular reactor. Um, and uh, the utilities can't really do much about nuclear waste disposal, right? That That's a federal government issue. We spent more than a billion dollars digging a hole in the side of Yucca Mountain and then, you know, didn't give the approvals to actually use it. So all the nuclear waste is piling up at nuclear reactors next to the reactors, which are always right next to large bodies of water, which in my opinion is a lousy place to store highly radioactive waste. But that's the state of the uh, country right now, I'm afraid. And with battery waste? Oh, the battery waste. Um, I doubt there's an explicit recycling program uh, in the IRP. I don't remember seeing anything like that. 
Uh, but there are companies springing up to recycle lithium ion batteries now that there's enough of them getting installed that that's, there's going to be a feedstock for them, right? We're also seeing um, the first, uh, out in Nevada, the first company that's going to uh, recycle solar panels, right? I keep seeing these things, all oh, these solar panels, what are we going to do with them all? They're going to fill the landfills. I'm like, well, they last 30 years, so it's going to be a while, and nobody's going to build a recycling plant until there's panels to recycle. So, you know, it's just a matter of timing. Uh, Julie, go ahead. Julie Roth? Yeah, hi. I put it in the chat, but the chat's busy, so I think it's, <laughs> it's going to get lost in there. But when um, I, I'm going to assume that DTE cannot or does not count distributed generation, both residential and commercial, when they're talking about the you know, they don't take credit for it in terms of the amount of renewable energy on the grid is that correct fabulous question and that was a huge fight in a prior case in which they they didn't and and we and numerous others took them to task for that and the uh uh, commission issued an order, and one of the statements in it that I, I loved enough to memorize is that uh, in an integrated resource plan, consideration of distributed generation is essential. Um, so they did put it in here. The way they put it in, though, from their viewpoint, DG is a reduction in load. So basically, they did their load forecast of how much electricity customers are going to demand. They subtracted off of that their projected DG production and kind of hit it away in the uh, load part of it instead of treating it like a uh, resource. And one of the uh, recommendations of, of a number of us in this was that they should create incentives, just like their um, demand response and their energy efficiency programs, they should create incentives for people to install DG to reduce their peak demand. Um, would have been interesting to see a commission order on that, but this went to settlement and that's not part of the settlement. Other than in their next IRP, they will model uh, such an incentive. So we did get it in there as a, a future modeling project. Well, that's really interesting. Thank you, John. Um, my, I, you know, I know that in general, util the way utility models work is, you know, they like to build things. <laughs> that's how they get their money, whether it's gas plants or coal <laughs> plants or whatever they're building and in some ways it might it might be better if instead of dg just reducing how much they have to build <laughs> that they could take credit for it and incentivize it and therefore the cap would be a completely useless thing altogether because the more the better to meeting the goals but um that's really interesting thanks for that nuance yeah, and i talked about that a good bit in my testimony i've got a slide later i'll talk about it a little bit yeah, John, why don't you go ahead and kind of finish up your slide, and then we'll have yep. uh, more, uh, time for more questions later. So the Bell River coal-fired plant, it's 1,270 megawatts. Um, they had proposed in 2019 to convert it to run on waste gases from a nearby steel plant. And it was kind of funny because in testimony, I challenged the future availability of those gases. And then later during the case, which takes about a year, the steel plant closed, meaning that there were no longer any waste uh, gases from the steel plant to use. So in this, they, they recommended and, and the settlement accepts converting it to a gas-fired peaker plant in 2025 and 2026. They're going to do it a half of the plant at a time because it has multiple units. And then the whole thing would be retired in 2040. The beauty of that is that it provides the capacity so that they can retire half of Monroe in 2028 instead of 2040 like they were planning. Um, and the conversion to gas, it, obviously gas is cleaner uh, than coal, uh, but also it's dramatically reducing the operating hours. This is going to be a somewhat inefficient plant. It'll be one of the last ones they fire up when they have absolute peak demand. It's a peaker plant. And as a result, their projections based on that is that the uh, total CO2 emissions will be reduced by 90 to 95%. So it's not zero, but it's a dramatic reduction. You, you get about a half reduction going from uh, uh, coal to natural gas, but it's, just, it's not going to be running that much. The Bell River plant runs like crazy, right? And, and that's going to change. 
And then your other pollutants, other than nitrogen oxides, but your sulfur oxides, uh, your, your particulates, your mercury, your arsenic, all that stuff drops to, to nearly zero. So converting the plant was, in my opinion, a, a very good thing, particularly because it's going to be a peaker plant operated seldom just during peak demand periods. Monroe is the second largest coal-fired power plant in the United States and the third largest single point source of CO2 in the country. It's a massive plant. It's 3,300 megawatts. Uh, it's been operating for 60 some years. And being a coal plant, it's very dirty. dirty. So the Clean Energy Task Force uh, is a well-funded organization. They do uh, environmental impact assessments for the EPA as consultants. They've estimated that Monroe is causing 38 deaths and 383 asthma attacks every year. And I just find that unconscionable. So I have a quote here from my testimony. Our continued use of coal-fired generation is literally killing people. The electric utilities pay none of this cost. The fact that these deaths are statistical without direct evidence that a specific person's death was certainly the result of a specific power plant does not detract from this tragedy. So, um, yeah, we, we need to close coal plants. Even if global warming was a non-issue, we need to close coal plants. Um, on renewable additions, there was a lot of argument in the case about how fast can DTE put up more wind and solar. And they said 500 megawatts a year is the absolute maximum they could ever do. They're hindered by local zoning and permitting. Uh, getting transmission access approved, which is a real and nationwide problem. It's taking four years now to get approvals for transmission hookups and supply chain disruptions. So I kind of took their own arguments and used that as like a judo throw and say, well, the, the solution to that is to focus on smaller solar facilities. They don't need transmission access. They hook up to the distribution grid. They don't attract local opposition. It's on somebody's roof. And I actually showed that the parts that are used are not the same ones that are used in the giant uh, utility scale ones, and that there's an ample supply of those. So it doesn't have the supply chain issues either. <clears throat> Again, because this went to settlement, we didn't get to uh, see the commission weigh in on that argument, but uh, I did enjoy making it. Ownership is a big issue. Um, DTE, for all this new wind and solar generation, has a competitive procurement process, which somehow just always ends up awarding the ownership to them. Um, <clears throat> They might build it themselves, or more often it's, they, they have some third party build it, but they buy it uh, as soon as it's completed. Because as Julie uh, so insightfully said, the way the utilities make money is by owning capital equipment. That's how they get profits. Um, but in the settlement, that practice ends. So uh, we've reserved about 35% of the new renewables and the storage for third party ownership because history has shown when, when third parties uh, build and own and operate it, it's lower in cost than when the utilities do. Um, so that was a, a, an interesting win. Now, DTE also in this settlement can earn a, a substantial incentive payment uh, on power purchase agreements. So that'd be some third party owns a power plant, but they're buying the power from it. If they procure 50% of their new capacity ads from third party ownership, but from kind of things they said in meetings and stuff, it's unclear to me if they are even going to attempt to do that. It, it's I, I don't know if that was window dressing or, or what, but we'll see. Um, so there is an incentive for them to go beyond the 35% to 50%. We'll see if it happens. Uh, as I said, uh, very importantly to, to us, the 1% cap was put in place by the legislature with net metering and then Foolishly, in my opinion, it was retained in the DG program and when net, net metering was repealed. Uh, and it's in the law, right? It's, it's statute from the legislature. The MPSC cannot force utilities to increase the cap, but a utility may do so voluntarily. So the settlement agreement is really the only way that we can get the cap increased other than having the legislature do something. Uh, you know what they say about an act of Congress is necessary. Um, so the utilities know this and they use this as leverage in, in negotiations um, and, and did, but we, we got the cap increased to 6%, which uh, is, is quite substantial with the same subcategories that the old 1% cap had. 
there were a few other good things here. The, the company proposed uh, energy waste reductions, that's energy efficiency incentives of uh, 2% of their sales uh, each year, uh, or 1.5%, I'm sorry, we got that increased to 2%. Uh, they're going to contribute $30 million to low-income bill assistance, given that they're jacking up the rates in this, um, that there's that's some offset to that. Uh, we also got them to contribute $8 million to a low-income energy efficiency, renewable energy, and storage uh, that's going to be administered by some unspecified uh, third-party organization at this point. So that'll be an, an interesting pilot program to see how that works. And then, and I think this came from the AG, uh, DT will report each October on political contributions of all DPE entities uh, that exceed $5,000. Um, that's uh, really new. And that will uh, at least shine some light on uh, how the uh, utilities are, are buying our legislature. Now, I've talked about all these things that we got in this settlement agreement that we got DTE to agree with. Well, what did they get? They got one really big thing. When a plant is retired, the company's entitled to recover through their electric rates the undepreciated value of the plant, right? That's the remaining book value for those of you who understand the accounting aspects there. And for the Bell River and the Monroe plants, that's about $4 billion. It's really big money. Now, it's mind-blowing to me that plants that are this old have these huge outstanding book values, but it's because utilities have been investing huge amounts of money in them for uh, mostly emission controls um, uh, as they've been operating over the decades. But normally, when a utility closes down a plant, they stop making a profit on that book value. Under this agreement, DT is going to recover the book value, but they will also continue earning a profit on $3 billion of that book value for 15 years from the filing of their next rate case. That's a lot of added profit to DTE's bottom line, and I think that's what they got in this agreement. That's why they were willing to agree to all those other things. I think it's very unlikely that the commission would have been so generous if this hadn't been done in settlement. If it had gone to a commission decision, they wouldn't have gotten all that money, but we wouldn't have gotten all these other things that we got. So that's just the nature of a settlement agreement. It's a compromise. Uh, you give some and you get some, and uh, that's the that's big thing DTE got. Now, my last two slides here are an appeal to you. Uh, we need to get the legislature to remove the cap on DG. First of all, it's just a bad policy to begin with. And secondly, as I said, the utilities keep using this as leverage to get more money out of us. And it's obscene. Uh, we tried this in 2022. We had a bill in the House Energy Committee to re remove the cap. Uh, but Joe Bellino out of Monroe, which DTE is a stronghold of Mon in Monroe, uh, he was the, the chairman of the House Energy Committee, and he just wouldn't schedule a vote on it. So it died in committee. Well, he left the House. He was term limited. Uh, we have a new legislature that's uh, a Democratic majority, and there's a new bill, uh, Senate Bill 362, uh, introduced by Jeff Irwin, and it eliminates the DG cap altogether. It does a number of other uh, good things for us. Please call your legislature, uh, your legislator for support of this. It eliminates the cap. It restores net metering, uh, at least temporarily. Uh, it will allow DG systems up to 200% of the customer's consumption instead of 100%, which has been a, a size limitation on solar installations. Uh, it'll create a uniform DG application form, so it'll be the same for all the utilities instead of these poor solar installers having to deal with applications for every different utility that are different. And then it would direct the MPSC to create a fair value tariff that is not less than the full retail rate minus delivery charge. That's what the DG program is today. So the new fair value tariff would be at least as good as what we're getting, but it specifically tells the commission to continue the value of 20 years of benefits, including energy capacity, avoided line losses, transmission and distribution investments, voltage support, reduced fuel price risk. That's one I've argued for, never gotten. Uh, economic benefits, including job creation and local tax revenue benefits. So there's all these additional things now that today the commission can't consider 
when they're setting the DG outflow rate that are by law in this bill, if it passes, would become part of the MPC's criteria when setting the outflow rate for DG uh, in the future. But also create a standard offer contract for systems larger than 500 kilowatts. So um, our experience with these IRPs is the utilities keep using the, the cap as leverage to get other things they want. And uh, this bill will handle that and do so much more for us. So please support Senate Bill 362. And with that, I'm just going to throw it open for questions. Go ahead, Julie. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, John, not just for the presentation, but for all of the amazing work that you and so many others have done on this um, to you know, to make this happen. Two questions. One is, um, what happens if DT just doesn't succeed? Like what, what are the, where are the teeth? Like what happens if they don't build the renewables that they're supposed to build in the settlement? What, you know, what happens? And two is that those billions and billions of dollars that they're going to get because they get the book value of the plant that's closing, um, is that going to massively raise rates? Because there's been, you know, finally, I think some MPSC hesitation at continuing to raise rates. So I wonder about that. Um, what's going to happen there? So those are, those are my two questions. Yeah. So the first one, unfortunately, the answer is there's not much teeth. Um, they've said, look, we, we're installing stuff as fast as we can. We have all these problems. Uh, they would clearly have to make a showing that they had tried and that it was, you know, uh, circumstances beyond their control that prevented them from meeting the, uh, the goals in this. Um, we might be able to argue then in a case that they haven't fulfilled their side of the settlement, so they don't get the other side. But frankly, I don't think uh you know there's a lot of teeth in that julie uh that that's a, a certainly a, a weakness um but, but i would i would suggest though that since dte goes back to the public service commission on a regular basis for rate increases that if they double crossed the interveners and the public service commissioners by not fulfilling what they agreed to and was approved by the commission that's going to backfire, I would suggest, on DTE in future relationships with the commission. Yes, I, I think there's a, a, a indirect teeth, right? There's nothing in the settlement agreement that says, if you don't do this, then here's you know what's going to happen to you. Uh, but, but clearly, uh, it would be bad for them. Um, I'm sorry, Julie, what was your second question? Uh, the second was about rates and the ah, billions yeah yeah so clearly that's going to have an effect on rates i have not seen an estimate of that impact because it's an irp not a rate case if it was a rate case they'd have to have that all laid out um so yeah it, it will it will be costly but I, i'm sorry i i couldn't put that in as a, a percentage or whatever I, I haven't figured that out no that's okay, okay. it's just it's it's very, very interesting simply because we are already one of the highest rates in the country so, um, as is. So how they're going to be able to go up from there is, I don't know, it, I'm bewildered by it. But it makes a really good case for on-site solar. <laughs> but that's, yes. that's, there are a couple of things that people should know is that currently DTE is asking for a $600 million increase in rates, which is about a 14% increase in residential rates. This is coming after DTE asked for about a $377 million last year, but the commission only gave them 30 million. So then legally, as John pointed out, you can only file one rate increase every 12 months. So each rate case takes 10 months from the beginning to the very end, and then the utility waits two months, and then they file their next rate increase. So after they got spanked and they only got 30 million out of the 377 they requested, they turned right around two months later, and, and they're asking for a $600 million increase in rates. 
which is outrageous. And I'd be shocked if this current commission was would grant them that those rates. But Julie is right. If they keep raising these rates, then that makes installing solar more economical and more of a financial incentive. So it's kind of a, a negative catch-22 in some ways. Yeah, go ahead, Dennis. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, thanks so much for your presentation here and all your work, my goodness, and, and uh, with the P MPSC and everything. Uh, I have more of a general question. I live in Holland, Michigan, and we um, uh, have, they have their own uh, power plant here. And I imagine that they're not under the P MPSC's uh, jurisdiction, that the C city council is uh, the one that regulates them. But do they have, does the, the uh, Holland Board of Public Works, are they required to have an IRP? Is that a state regulation or is that an MPS? I see. Okay. It is a state uh, regulation for the utilities regulated by the Public Service Commission. There's a bunch of, you know, specifics about who, but it, it's not munis, no. I see. Um and I think we have fairly lower rates than uh, uh, a lot of the other utilities, but there are a lot of other uh, local plants, aren't there, in Michigan, like uh, Holland's doing with their uh, own system? Uh, there are, I used to know the number, there, there, there's a bunch of municipal and, and you know rural co-ops in Michigan. Um, Lansing Board of Power and Light is the, the biggest of the, the munis. Um, but uh, we, we've got a number of them around, yeah. I think it's 42. That sounds right. Thank you, Harvey. Richard, go ahead. Thanks. I um, didn't hear anything about community solar in this, and I was wondering if there's any update on that. Good question. Uh, it's uh, one of the key issues in a different case. So in DTE's rate case, uh, we brought up, and we and others brought up community solar. And the commission said, hey, that's a really good issue, uh, but we don't have time in a rate case to settle it because rate cases are by statute limited to 10 months. Uh, and they kicked it over to the voluntary green pricing program case, uh, which is currently going on for DTE. And they said, DTE, you have to submit two new added pieces of to your filing, one that talks about your uh, plan for community solar and one that is a plan for buying uh, renewable energy certificates from DG customers. Now that was in there specifically because of my testimony. Uh, none of the other interveners came up with that idea, but I said, look, we're uh, selling DTE green power. They're selling green power at a premium, but we're not getting the premium. We ought to get that. Uh, unfortunately, DT's filing in that case is really lame. Uh, they said, look, we have the My Green Power program where you can buy green power from us. That's community solar. Well, it's nonsense. It's nothing like community solar, uh, but uh, that, that's what they said. So that, that case is ongoing, and we've written some furious counters to that. And they said, in terms of buying uh, uh, renewable energy certificates from uh, DG customers, uh, we'll do that if and when we feel like it. Well, that was also non-responsive to the commission order because they that was already the case, right? If, if you look at your contract, it actually says they can buy RECs from you in a separate contract if you so agree. Uh, so that was no change from the status quo. So we're very involved in that case. Um, and I'm a witness in that case. And it will be very interesting to see how the commission uh, rules on that because DTE's uh, response was really just, just ignored the commission's order, in my opinion. Um, and several other people's opinion. But uh, yeah, so that's where community solar is being fought out. Uh, but really the best place to get community solar would be at the legislature again. Most of the states that have a good community solar program have it because the state legislature mandated it. Yeah, are there, same, are there any pending bills about that? Yes, the there's Senate Bill 152 and Senate Bill 153. And Jeff Irwin, state senator from Ann Arbor, he has Senate Bill 153. And then Ed McBroom, who is a Republican from the UP, he has Senate Bill 152. 
and they both have to be enacted for the law to take effect. There, it's, a, it's a phrase called tie barred together. And so the idea is that you have a bipartisan pair of bills so that it attracts both Republicans and Democrats to support. And in the, and we've been trying to get community solar enacted, just like John was our, talking about the 1% cap bill. But Joe Bellino wouldn't schedule a bill on that either, even though there was a Republican sponsor, you know, the previous legislative session. So we are optimistic um, that this fall, that community solar, the 1% cap, and then there are three other bills um, that will be all part of a negotiation session in the Senate and in the House that may end up being hopefully passed. Because the other element in all this is that the governor has the Michigan Healthy Climate Plan, which is a fairly lengthy document on how the governor wants to reduce carbon emissions in Michigan. But in order for her to make that plan a reality, she has to get legislation enacted to promote more solar, promote more geothermal, promote community solar, turn loose the private sector. And so that's why we're optimistic that we'll see some action this fall. And on September 26, there's going to be a legislative day of action in Lansing, where it's going to be a big rally on the front of the Capitol, the lawn in front of the Capitol. We're going to be making legislative visits to talk about these bills and encourage them to support them. So if all of you are interested in coming to Lansing, I've been talking about this in the weekly newsletter that goes out to our members, and there's a place to sign up um, to come to Lansing. So if you're interested and you want to have a wonderful day in the Capitol, um, come and join us and sign up. Uh, Charles, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, hi. Uh, John, this is great. Uh, my question has to do, it's actually following up with what John Freeman just said. Uh, in terms of the uh, added green power that's going to be put now on the grid or greater proportion of green power on the grid with the uh, the rays of what was it 430 megawatts um how what how much you know in terms of the vision of the governor and stuff how where, where does that put us how you know how far behind the eight ball are we where are we at what what percentage of energy now will be produced through green power once if and when all this is implemented and what is that goal towards the state's goal for by 2050 yeah, uh, Father, that's a great question, um, and I should have come with a prepared answer for that because it was it was in the filing, right? The filing shows uh, what the the you know percentage reduction in CO two is in the different years, uh, so that information is there, uh, but I didn't um, didn't include that here. Uh, I mean, right now we're not much ahead of the 15% RPS, right? But both DTE and Consumers Energy, the two biggest utilities in the state, have these very rapid uh, renewable energy rollout programs, uh, and you know we're certainly going to see some very dramatic uh, shifts in that. Let me give you a sense of this. So the total generating capacity of the state of Michigan, right, all the power plants in the state, is I think about uh, 22,000 megawatts. So when I say, hey, we're adding, you know, uh, 7,000 here and 3,000 there, and, and it's it's substantial pieces of the total. Uh, John, go ahead. Uh, thanks again. Um, and John, John Richter, uh, uh, thank you for uh, for putting all this information together. It's uh, It's been really helpful to see all at once. News stories never do it justice. Excuse me. Um, I'm I, I've been looking <clears throat> at the bill to eliminate the cap, uh, Jeff Irwin's bill to eliminate the cap, and um, I'm wondering if you can uh, explain the political wisdom of putting all kinds of good things all together in one bill, rather mm -hmm. than having separate bills, uh, so that some of those changes might be implemented, even if others are not. Yeah, last year we had a bill that just eliminated the cap. That's all it did. It was like a really short bill. It was very understandable and clean. Um, 
I mean, I'm not a political, you know, expert. Um, John Freeman here was a state legislator, so he may weigh in on this. But my thinking would be it'd be better to to have, you know, smaller bites. Uh, but uh, you know, wasn't my decision. Yeah, it's um there's always a debate about what is the best strategy when you're trying to move policy. Um, if you break up bills into many small bills, it's you have to pass them all in order to enact a lot of different policies. And that is challenging because there are a lot of other competing demands in other committees and the attention of the legislative leadership. So if you can pack stuff in a bill and you've got the political support for that bill, then you just need to pass one bill and it goes over to the House or goes over to the Senate, you know, and then he goes to the governor and, and you can make things happen. The other, the other part of it is that if you do have many sections in a bill, you can negotiate with your opposition, in this case, the utilities, and say, okay, you know, we're willing to, if you're willing to back off from opposing the bill, full court press, then we'll take some stuff out, you know, you know, the stuff that you really hate the most. And so, so that is part of the, the challenge when you're trying to move stuff, because again, all the, you can have all the great policies in the world, but if you can't get the votes to get it out of committee, or you can't get the votes to get it out of the house or in the opposite house, the Senate, then your theoretical bill doesn't do anything. So it's a matter of what you can build political support for. Um, and and the, the challenge is, and when, when John mentioned that 5,000 amount disclosure in this IRP that, that DTE now has to provide every October, DTE is one of the most powerful lobbying forces in Michigan, because literally about 90% of legislators have historically maxed out in terms of the, they take the most money they can from DTE because DTE will give it to them. And then of course, DTE has dark money that they can spend independent of the candidate and they can either support a candidate who is carrying water for them like Joe Bellino when he ran for the Senate or in the case of um, oh, a, a representative uh, that just recently died, he was a thorn in the utility side. And so when he ran for the Senate, DT and consumers spent a ton of money in an independent expenditure campaign to defeat him in the primary, and they were successful. You know, so you know, DTE is a formidable opponent. They play hardball. And so by including different items in a bill, that can be part of a negotiating strategy, particularly when, in this case, you've got all three branches of government run by the Democrats. And most importantly, you've got a governor who has national aspirations. If she is serious about her national aspirations, she has to enact energy legislation because climate change and promoting renewables and electric cars that is, in my opinion, the most cutting edge series of national and international debate that's going on right now. And Jennifer Granholm became the head of Department of Energy simply because she enacted Public Act 295 back in 2008. So if Gretchen Whitmer is interested in moving forward nationally, I think she needs to get stuff done this fall, which means that she's going to lean in and put pressure on the Speaker of the House and Winnie Brinks, the state, the Senate Majority Leader, to really promote some of these bills that John and I talked about. Go ahead, Lee. Yeah, my question is about who of taxes. Can you hear me? Yeah, go yeah, ahead. It's, your audio cut out for a second, but you're back. Yeah, so payment in lieu of taxes uh, passed, you know, the headlines were basically just what we expected. But then if you read the fine print, it says, if you put this on a brownfield or you put it on public policy uh, land that's owned by the public, 
you only have to pay $2,000 in taxes. Was this something that GLREA backs or was this something that some special interest group added? I mean, I like the idea because it allows us to pick places that can do provide dual purpose. But from what I read in that bill, if you put it on a brownfield or if it's owned by or if it's on land that's owned by a municipality or the state, you only have to pay $2,000 per megawatt. So how does GLA... How much is it if it's not on a brownfield? Well, yeah, I don't actually know. $7,000 a, a megawatt. Wow. Well, we didn't, we didn't get super involved in this case. Um, I tend to stick to what we know best. But we were certainly in support of it. And the reason is, is that a lot of these new large solar farms and wind turbine farms, they're located in the rural parts of the state. And the local units of government are under immense political pressure, number one, by some funded right-wing conservative activists that oppose it, that are being funded nationally by the Koch brothers. And at the same time, you know, these rural governments need income, tax income to build schools and recreational centers and provide city services. And so what was happening was that, you know, the tax issue, the taxes were becoming problematic um, and the local units of government weren't trusting of the utilities when they were making these commitments about how much taxes they will pay. And so this idea of payment in lieu of taxes is a it's a contractual obligation now that is a part of the agreement between the utility and the local unit of government when they when the local unit of government gives their stamp of approval for zoning or or the permitting process they now will be included in the contract how much money they will be they will receive per megawatt and it's a guarantee and so that provides that provides clear, you know tr complete transparency and a complete utter ironclad commitment and so it helps to take out the guesswork and if we want the utilities to transition from fossil fuel plants like Monroe to wind and solar we need to help them to be able to site these places in the rural parts of the state and so making it easy for local units of government to make the argument to the local constituents yet that yes we should allow these wind turbines or or solar farms sure they may not be the most beautiful things in the world but we're going to get a lot of money that's going to help the local community help pay for schools and and new recreational and services and they also going to create jobs. Not a, you know they'll create a lot of jobs in construction. But even after they've they're completed, they're going to provide some a few year round jobs, which will help young people in the local community stick around. So it's it's a good I think it's a good thing. And you know so and if they can put brownfields to work, that's a good use. That's a better use of land than always using pristine farmland for. For solar farms, um, even you know, so I think it's a good thing. And and the other bill that is being talked about is a siting bill. That right now, look as as Andre knows, he and I went to Manchester three or four times in support of AOS AES trying to get the local permission um, to to support a you know a utility scale solar farm, and the local. The local folks had a heck of a hard time, you know, moving forward on because there was some backlash from the local community. And this is happening all over Michigan. And a lot of it is, again, stemming from a lot of misinformation. And there are some activists that are being funded at the national level to stir up trouble at the local level. And so there's a debate going on of whether the state can have a little bit more authority in terms of siting. Because right now it's all done by local units of government. And sometimes those folks are overwhelmed by the pressure that they've received from both the utility as well as some of the local activists. So it's a tough one. Hey, Harvey, uh, you get the last question. Go ahead, Harvey. Thank you. I was wondering about Steve 20 minutes ago, Steve Noble 
Stephen asked a question, uh, can a homeowner that's already getting uh, net metering from DTE add to their system under this agreement or not until the provisions of uh, bills 362 are approved? Great question. So when um, net metering got replaced with the distributed generation program, part of that was if you add to your system, well, your grandfather's broken, you're now in the DG program. Um, if this bill passed, then net metering, everybody's going to be on net metering. It's not a grandfathered issue. So then you could add to your heart's delight. Well, but John, to clarify too, I think you said in your slide that's a temporary thing until they come up with this uh, value tariff, right? Right. You have a window of opportunity there, but the the uh, the new tariff would certainly be better than the current DG tariff, and it might be actually more than that metering. We don't know, um, and and so you might want to convert to that um, depending on where it lands, right? So it'll be a whole whole bunch more cases and arguing about that if that bill passes. Well, we're we're past eight o'clock. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, I think this has been uh, excellent information for uh, for all of us because this has been a really important settlement agreement. Uh, and I hope everybody uh, next week, we're not going to have a presentation on Thursday, but we'll resume the week after. So hopefully you join us in a couple of weeks. And uh, in the very near future, we're going to have uh, Dale Klein uh, repeat performance on time of use rates, which is of uh, interest to a lot of folks, uh, especially DTE customers, but it's an issue too for consumers energy. So Hopefully uh, you'll join us for that presentation. I believe that one's August 31st. Um, and so, hey, again, thanks for uh, coming and uh, come back again. <laughs>